Welcome to the Tech Canada podcast, The Leadership Standard. And I am so excited about this particular podcast because of who we have joining us all the way from downtown Langley, British Columbia. Accomplished, highly accomplished, um, a, a, a community oriented leader. Uh, he's involved in no fewer than three real estate brokerages in British Columbia. And that automatically would qualify Jamie as a real estate mogul. Uh, he's also uh, the founder, the co founder of Camp Beer. In 2018, beer is always a good thing, no matter what part of Canada you're talking about. Uh, Jamie also was recognized one time as the top 1% of Royal LePage agents nationwide. I could go on and on and on with his credentials, but more than anything, um, great guy, uh, fantastic entrepreneur, visionary. Jamie, uh, welcome to the Leadership Standard. Thanks for having me, Gear. Happy to be here. Yeah, Jamie Schrader and I cross paths. Full disclosure, we cross paths, uh, I think, in person. It was back in November, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And yeah. you you hosted a, a real estate conference with over 200 delegates. Um, and that's when I got the first sense, especially when we went to the headquarters of Craft Beer and 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 really got to know each other a little bit. And I thought maybe we could start this way. I think people would be curious to know. You know, sometimes it's hard enough just to run one business. You've got your hands in multiple pots, if you will. Where did your entrepreneurial journey begin? Jamie, if you were to take us back to like, you know, because you were a licensed realtor at 20, but I'm always fascinated by people and their origin stories. Yeah, Gear. Um, I was, I, I think, somewhat typical of of many entrepreneurs. I was the kid that did the lemonade stands and cut grass for neighbors, and at a very early age saw that if if I worked hard and and uh, created value for other people, I there was a direct reward. Um, that direct reward at 10, 11 years old was more candy, um, and now I get the adult version of it, which is probably. Uh, the beer side of things. Uh, there's a direct result there that I can buy as much beer as I want now. Um, yeah, I, I just, I, I, I was very um, lucky to be put in a position at a younger age, uh, business age. When I was licensed at 20, I had a very, very good mentor that uh, took me under his wing, showed me a few different angles on the, the real estate business, um, which is not typical for most realtors. Most realtors step into the, the real estate world and they sell houses. Um, I had an education in commercial real estate, and then uh, my mentor had a number of businesses in uh, the mortgage industry, property management, commercial real estate, residential real estate. So I got to see everything. Um, and then from there, I just, it was just that, uh, that innate desire to, to build, to create, and to do far too many things. And um, we're continuing to do that now. I'm going to bring you back, though, to when you were what was the specific magic moment? You're a little kid. Was it the yeah. lemonade stand? What was it exactly where, where you got money for doing your thing that you actually kind of loved? Like, can you recall the moment? If one moment, Jamie, where the spark uh, ignited and lit the torch. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't remember maybe the 10, 11 year old Jamie version of this, but uh I had a job on my 15th birthday. That was my first day of work, which legally is, is when you're allowed to work in BC. And um, I worked at a fish and chip restaurant and in the back kitchen, it wasn't a glorious job by any stretch of the imagination, but um, I worked with a few of my buddies there and we all saved money and saved money. And then I bought my first car when I turned 16. And it was, I, I think a continuation of that 11, 12 year old Jamie, the 15, 16 year old Jamie saw that if you work hard, if you do the right things, you have, freedom to make decisions. And at that age, um, it's not an altruistic view of the world. And you're trying to make the world a better place. You're trying to impress girls mm -hmm. and um, have enough spending money to do fun things, which two vitally important questions. Uh, what was the car, the make and model of the car and what was on the <laughs> playlist? Yeah, uh, so it was a 1985. So the car was older than I was. Uh, 1985 Chevy S10 Blazer that was lowered with an eagle on the side, 
I had two subwoofers in the back. We took the muffler off it. So it was nice and loud. Uh, and so I was, I was the coolest kid, as you could imagine driving that thing. Um, and on the playlist, I was into the kind of the nineties rap at that stage of my life. Yeah. Well, um, you know, and we could probably talk at length about that, but, uh, but when you think back to those early days, the the eleven year old, the fifteen year old, how much of those early formative experiences shaped the way you think now? Hmm. Yeah, a tremendous amount, and uh, uh, it's kind of a unique situation. So my wife actually teaches high school, um, and uh, I just told the story about. Uh, sort of successful little entrepreneurial Jamie, but uh, that wasn't that wasn't the full picture. I was a C minus student. I did enough to get by in high school and just just barely tracked through until uh, I was about seventeen or eighteen and realized that I couldn't just sort of skip through school and that mm-hmm. there was a direct result of doing well in school and um, uh, being successful in life. So that that shifted significantly for me as I got to the the latter years in, in high school. And um, I don't know if I dodged your question there. Gary. No, I'm just, I'm yeah. just, like I say, I'm always fascinated by when I meet someone like yourself, Jamie, what strikes me and it really hit me when we were together in person is that somehow we see people all the time in business who get beat up, who get skeptical, cynical, jaded you still bring youthful enthusiasm to the game every every day what's the secret to that and how much of that do you attribute to your upbringing and 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 youthful jamie gotcha gotcha yeah um i i i think it's it's appreciating the journey throughout like being an entrepreneur and i would imagine most of the listeners that are listening to this are are in the situation that Um, you can reach certain levels of success, but if you don't appreciate the process to getting there, the journey of getting there and the people that are alongside you as you're going throughout it, you're not going to be a very happy person, um, regardless of what it looks like from the, the outside. Um, I've been just absolutely privileged to have good people around me, good mentors, good people to work with, good partners in business that I enjoy the process. So win or lose, and obviously the target is win in, uh, in the business situations that we have, we enjoy the process. And, and I think that keeps me optimistic day to day that I, I can get through the storms a little bit better because I know that I've, I've got a good process and the, the inputs uh, are correct. Any entrepreneurial journey, as you well know, is marked by different setbacks, obstacles that somehow you've got to turn into opportunity. Can you relate a specific story, not generalities, but a specific story where you think back, Jamie, because I think the people watching and listening would would want to just love to hear how did you turn, quote unquote, business lemons into lemonade? Yeah, uh, be a good specific. Uh, I've, yeah, here's a good one, actually. Um, COVID, the, the, the lockdown that we had March of 2020. So we had uh, uh, roughly 300 realtors under our banner, um, or just shy of that at the time. And uh, when the world closed, um, we had a lot of pressure on us as a brokerage. Real estate wasn't being sold. Our business model relies a lot on the monthly income we make from our realtors, the deals they do, and then just the constant income that they pay to be a part of our brand. Um, we had pressure to uh, relieve fees, to relax fees or waive them. And uh, we did a lot of stuff with that for our agents to help them out. Um, we hold a little bit of real estate as well. So we had a number of tenants that were coming to us and saying, we're not paying our rent. Um, I had uh, mortgage holders on our real estate that were not waiving mortgage payments. So it was a very... Uh, uh, stressful time to say the least. Um, I had my first, we had our first daughter, our first child during that period of time, May of 2020, she was born, she was in the NICU, she's fine, but it was, it was a, an up and down time. So one of the things we did with our, our realtors, as an example, was we're not going to stay at home. We're not going to do nothing. Um, we get that we cannot sell real estate or it's very difficult to sell real estate at that time. So what we ended up doing was, uh, we were doing zoom calls with them every day. And 
the the initial um, focus was business development, self development, leadership. Um, we did a bit of uh, internal um, speaking of myself and uh, a bit of our leadership group. And then we hit a point where we had done too many, like we were doing them every day for a month and we were getting kind of tired of listening to people talk about business and real estate and lead generation and all that kind of stuff. So um, we we tapped a few of our agents on the shoulder that were really good at something outside of real estate, like um, photography or fitness or all these different things. And our agents were tuning in every day. Most uh, operators in our category brokerages just kind of shelled up and said, we can't sell anything. Let's just, mm. let's do nothing and not communicate with our agents. We were on video with them every day. I brought our group together. Uh, we're a much tighter knit group of 300 people than we were going into COVID. And I think that was a direct result of leaning in on what was available to us during a hard time. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it, it reminds me historically a little bit of Winston Churchill in May of 1940 when, you know, the world's falling apart. Real leadership uh, involves you got to head right into the foxhole and, and dig in. Uh, speak to that a little bit, because I think in COVID that we saw a lot of people run for the hills, but it was an opportunity for champions to emerge. Yeah, yeah. Um... Funny you mentioned Winston Churchill. I'm a I'm a student of 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 his of his what he did through the, the period of time that he was uh, so so prominent. Um, one uh, piece of literature I read, and and I I read a lot. I listen to my books um, and listen to a lot of podcasts. But one that really resonated with me during that time was Robin Sharma. Is uh, the, the monk who sold his Ferrari, the five AM club. He he sent an email out. It was called the. I might get this wrong, the War Measures Act or something to that effect, that when things really, really suck, uh, here are the things that separate the good from the bad. And here are the things that you need to do. And it was a list of, I don't know, 10 or 15 things. And I, I had that printed and sitting on my desk at home. And I went through that every morning that um, things are bad and things could get worse, but we are where we are. And all we can control is the input. All we can do is control our day, how we influence ourselves and the people around us to be better people. And external factors will always uh, be there. Um, but as long as we are doing the right things individually and collectively as a group working towards a common goal, we'll be fine. That, that's a great segue. Leaders are readers. The, the more you learn, the more you earn. What you mentioned, Robin Sharma, I know you're a big fan of Jocko Willink and yeah. extreme ownership. What would be some of the other three, four or five, you know, authors, um, thought leaders that have really helped shape your entrepreneurial thinking and journey? Yeah. Um, and again, the, the listeners to this, I'm, I'm sure would be in the same boat as I am and, and any budding entrepreneur. I always say, like, talk to your mentors that are good entrepreneurs. And I guarantee you, they are voracious readers. They're always learning. They're always listening to podcasts and reading books. Um, uh, Dale Carnegie, I really like uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I, I think the world would be a much better place if every human read that book. Um, Jocko Willink. So any, anyone that reports directly to me in any of our organizations, uh, I give them those two books, uh, how to win friends and influence people and extreme ownership. And, uh, the reason for that, I love the books. I love the messaging behind the books. Um, and I think that if you're working in a cohesive team, if you're speaking the same language or having the same understanding that, um, this is the methodology of how we operate, it, it helps everyone row the boat in the same direction. Um, the richest man in Babylon, I really like, uh, the alchemist was a good book. Uh, um, I've got a library full, uh, gear and, uh, as a, as a younger man, I'd read one or two a month. Uh, now I'm usually listening to podcasts. It's, it's harder with screaming children and screaming realtors in the background to get through a, a book at good pace. You've got a beautiful wife, two wonderful, adorable daughters, 300 realtors, you got a beer company. I'm thinking besides real estate mogul and entrepreneur, you have developed some world-class ability in terms of work-life balance. How do you do it? Yeah, and uh, uh, I think I'm a pretty humble guy, Gear, but this is the thing that I'm the most proud of is, is the 
the amount of hours I spend on business versus at home. Um, and this was my lovely wife that kind of kicked me in the butt to, to be better at this when her and I first got together. Uh, and she, she'll get mad at me if I get this wrong 11 or 12 years ago. Um, that she, so high school teacher, she gets the summers off. This was, we had just really started getting or together and she called me like two days into her summer break and said, what are we doing today? And I like, Alex, it's Tuesday at 11 o'clock. Like I'm at work. What do you mean? What are we doing today? Um, but her expectation was I was taking the summers off with her, which I now thankfully do. Um, and it, I, I love work. I love working at a, at a high clip. I like working at a fast pace. Um, but now my days are very, very intentionally. Um, I'm at my desk at 830. I go to the gym at 330. I pick my daughter up from daycare at 430 and my phone is off at five. Um, I rarely, rarely work a weekend. And it, it, it's just, it's, it's all things. If you're intentional about it, it, it's far easier to do. And I've been very intentional about it. Um, and my team around me um, respect that. And I respect that with them as well, that it's fantastic to be successful at work, but I would rather you be more successful at home. Um, and if, if that life at home looks really good, your life at work is probably going to look really good as well within reason. And there's no such thing as work-life balance, but uh, the fight to get there is is important, I think. And I didn't even bring up your numerous community projects and groups that you're involved with, let alone your hockey team. Now, tell us the story <laughs> of the hockey team. I think a lot of people, uh, they already know you're a busy guy and a successful guy, but you've all, you added hockey to the portfolio. Yeah, so uh, it actually the the sort of rubber stamp is going on as you and I are talking. So the deal is done, uh, but we're waiting on our final legal approval, which is happening this morning. It's sort of a rubber stamp. Um, uh, BC Hockey League franchise, junior A level, um, and this was this is uh, very similar to the other uh, businesses we're in. The, the beer story is almost identical to the hockey story. That very fortuitous. Um, having an interaction with a, with a future potential partner that has the same passion, same vision, same values as I do. Um, it's just so cool Gary. I don't know if I need to explain why I'm getting into hockey. Like, Oh, I, would I, buy think, an <laughs> I think the non hockey people would be fascinated. This, you know, when you think of the thousands and thousands and soon to be millions of listeners and viewers of the Tech Canada podcast, surely there's someone out there who who's dying to who's curious to know what's what's the magic. Yeah. Uh, so the 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 fire in my belly that gets me excited about this. Um, and I think this is a good um, someone did this exercise with me a number of years ago, and I can't remember who it was or why we were doing it, but it was uh finding flow state. What gets you in flow state? Where where are you physically and what are you doing when you get into flow state where you lose track of time and you can have four or five hours go by and you don't know why or what happened? And th this sounds kind of funny, but mine is, as a young man was, uh, I grew up in a video game era and a sports video game era. So I know I've never played Call of Duty or any, I don't know any of the other games, but I would play sports games and I wouldn't actually play the game. I would play the, like the manager mode of making trades and drafting and signing free agents. And that was my flow state where I, I would just get in this absolute zone. So the, the, the thought was if, if ever there was an opportunity to do that in the sports world, I would do that. When I was doing that exercise, it, it made me realize that my day to day of assemble, essentially what I do is assemble teams and, ensure that they operate within our organizations and within my team selling real estate as well. So that's my flow state. I was doing it on a regular basis. And now this hockey team, um, like Gary, just as an example, we had our prospect camp last weekend and these are, we have 120 players competing for essentially four to five spots in our main camp. I was there all day long, eight to eight for the practices, for the games. It was absolutely exhilarating for me to watch hockey practice. Um, and I got to be a part of that with our hockey operations team to, to sort of shortlist some of these players. And yeah. So five years from now, when the Toronto Maple Leafs are looking for their next general manager, I'm guessing <laughs> you will have had enough, shall we say, rink experience to bring to the table. 
Yeah, the, the Leafs, it might be sooner than that, though. They're, they're without a GM right now, and they might need another one in a year or two with the way that they turn over. Yeah, well, I was just thinking uh, maybe uh, Jamie just needs a little seasoning first in the BCJHL <laughs> before he goes all the way. Would that be the ultimate dream job for you if you if you left it all behind to be GM of an NHL team? Uh, you know what? Great, great question here. Probably not. I think I, I, I've got a... Uh, shiny object syndrome that it would be a fun job for me for a year or two, but I would look to put somebody in place to operate that if I could. Yeah. Let's talk about, let's talk about that because that right there crystallizes. I think one of the key things that I've, I've noticed that separates wildly successful entrepreneurs, very successful entrepreneurs from those who struggle. Focus. How do you maintain focus, which so much of it, as you know, involves saying the two-letter word, no? Yeah, uh, I think it's knowing what you're good at. And you're not, you can't, when you have a, a scaled organization and, and um, you're sort of beyond the infancy stage of a business um, where you don't have to do everything, because there are certain points of, of a business maturity where you probably do have to do everything it's knowing what you're good at. And here I know I can't look, stare at financial statements all day and I'm not great on the human resources side of things. And um, it, it, yeah, it is knowing when to say no. It's knowing when you're out of your element or where there's somebody that's better than you at that and finding that person to do it. Um, one of uh, my mentors, he, uh, he was the largest private landowner of real estate in BC for a number of years. He was in the real estate brokerage world as well. Um, one of the things that he ingrained in me is he said, always take that next step and then infill behind you, build that fort behind you. So you'll never lose that traction that you've got the next stage, the next stage, the next stage. And I've, I've been, thank, I've been uh, fortunate enough that I've had really good people so that when we do something like we acquired a real estate brokerage three years ago is we took that next step. We found really good people to run it. We built that little fort behind us and now we can go on to the next one or in the craft beer world. Um, same thing is, is we've, we, we had a little model. We got really good people in there and now we go to the next one. We put more good people in there and we go to the next. And, and the sim, the symbolic reference you just described is a fort. Just expand yeah. on that a little bit. That's, that's intriguing. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, that mentor I mentioned, uh, his name's Rudy Nielsen. Uh, so LandQuest Realty and um, Niho Land and Cattle are his two main companies. He's a cowboy. Um, Rudy's, I want to say 79 years old now. Um, and uh, he lived the life of a cowboy in business. And and I was just drawn to that. Like I watched Western movies as a kid. I still do. It's my favorite genre of movie. And and when him and I were talking or we talk around this concept, he, uh, he, he, he sort of used those analogies that like you can't expand into a new territory and set up a uh, tent because somebody's going to come take that area from you in that tent. They set that fort up, uh, build that uh, so that no one can take it from you. And, and a person that's been through those harder times of, say, 1982 uh, has a very different perspective on what can be taken from you uh, compared to a a kid that's never seen a, a bad um, um, economic world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me ask you this. We ask, this is, we, you know, we call this program the leadership standard and we have a standard question we ask of every guest because it's always fascinating to hear the answers. So I want you to reflect and think about this. When you think of, all of Jamie Schrader's personal life experiences, especially in the business world, uh, but also in life in general, how would you define leadership? Hmm. Yeah, I, I think leadership takes a lot of forms, Gare, and um, for me, the most effective um, way I've been led, and uh, I hope that I I lead as well with people around me. Um, I I think of leadership as is almost synonymous with helping. If, if you help the people that uh, are are interacting with you, and that can be a a customer, client, it can be an employee, it can be a family member, um, achieve what they're trying to achieve. If you help them achieve their success, whatever that's defined by, if it's it's wealth or 
climbing a ladder of some kind, or if you help them solve their problems, or if you help them win at the game they're trying to play, I think that makes you a good leader. So much of your success also depends on decision making. What what factors do you evaluate in terms of making a decision? Um, because I think it was Colin Powell that once famously said, you'll never have all the facts. If yeah. you, you only get about 70% of the facts before, because if you had all the facts, it would be a foregone conclusion. But just uh, illuminate us, if you will, on your decision-making process. Yeah, uh, and that's a great question, Gare. Um, I I Again, uh, just personality wise, I've I've never been I've never had a struggle with making quick decisions. And I think that's just in the nature of the business that we have to make uh, we have to be decisive. We have to make quick decisions and move on to the next problem. Um, uh, that's funny you mentioned the Colin Powell quote, because uh, that is one of the things that we always ask in our group when we're trying to solve something is, are we at are we asking the right questions? Are we trying to solve the problem that's in front of us or is there a different problem that we're we're blind to. Do we have all of the facts is one of the questions we ask, um, which is is interesting because we you're right, you can never have all of the facts. Do you have correct information is maybe a better way to say that. Um, I, I think it's it's being accepting that you're not always going to make the right decision. Um, but if you make the decision that you think is right at the time, given the information you have, given the time constraints, given the resources restraints that you have, um, accepting that result, uh, I think is the more important thing. Because if you don't accept that result, whether it was a good or bad decision, the next time you have a decision of similar nature, you will hesitate and you probably will take too much time or you will make an incorrect decision because you're afraid of another negative result. Have you detected, uh, just listening to you, have you you detected the market, if you will, has become less forgiving when it comes to mistakes and missteps? Hmm. I I think they're probably more apparent when you make a misstep because of the, uh, the, the speed of communication and the speed of information today. Um, it's, it's like that, uh, the the interpretation of news the input of news that people receive today is the i've looked at more news and more information this morning than a person 300 years ago saw in a lifetime i think the frequency of of bad news and mistakes is is probably not uh at a higher rate i think it's just communicated and broadcast and observed by more people the um and that's that begs another interesting question is when you think about the leadership team, uh, I know that you've got your brother. I know you've got David and maybe you want to shout out a few others. But what are the trends that make you guys curious like right now? What's happening now that you're actually paying attention to? Yeah. Uh, and those guys you mentioned, so my brother and uh, David Smith are my partners in the brokerage world. Um, they would be better guys to ask this question and this might surprise so out of all of the business partners i have i'm the youngest but uh they kind of joke with me uh about my nature of being more traditional and there's trends and there's technology and there's new ways of doing business and absolutely innovate i we have to but i am usually the um, opposing voice to that in our strategy sessions that if there if there's a way of doing business and there's a, a proven way of doing it, I agree with tweaks and modifications. But I'm rarely the one that says let's flip this thing upside down. Um, and I don't know why that is or if it's going to work, but uh, so far it has. And um, our our sort of tagline with our real estate brokerages is our real estate brokerage, uh, the Wollstonecroft brand is how old is it now? 108 years old. Um, and we're a very young leadership group. So our, our sort of tagline there is a story of history and, uh, or sorry, a story of tradition and innovation. Um, so we want to keep doing things the way we've done them. We're willing to tweak, but um, I'm usually the opposing voice to that. Which begs another interesting question. Uh, I saw this on YouTube a few years ago. Can't remember exactly when, but I never forgot Jeff Bezos. Jeff was asked the question about 
just like what we talked about. And he said at the time, he's more interested in what's not going to change. Mm. So in this rapidly changing world, which will only accelerate year over year over year, Bezos was saying, well, here's what's not going to change. Customers will always want lower prices. Uh, they will want uh, more selection and faster delivery on, on the products and services. Like That's not going to change. And when you think about it, that has, you know, to a large degree shaped at a very strategic uh, uber clarity level what Amazon became. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm curious, from your experience, what have you learned, Jamie, about the things in business that will never change? Yeah, uh, those are and that's those are all great points too, Gear. Uh, or great comments from the quote from Bezos. Um, one that we talk about a lot on the beer side of things. So uh, I'll do a little shameless plug for the brewery on this one. Uh, we're a four-year-old brewery, three years old. We were closed for COVID um, and had to shift our business model incredibly. Um, but we won three separate awards for best tasting room in the province last year. So that's 100 and what are there 180 plus breweries in the province. And one of the things we talk about a lot in, in that uh, conversation is people aren't here to drink beer. They're here for an experience. They need a memorable experience. And if the beer is good, absolutely it has to be. But people are not going to tell their friends that the beer was good here. They're going to tell people how our server interacted with them, that they remembered their first name, that they they visited on the third time and they asked what their kid was doing that day or um, the little things uh, that they do. So people look for, in any case, whether they're buying a product, a service, an experience of some kind. And with a service, you can deliver that while the the, the sale is going on, um, which is um, uh, very relevant to the real estate industry. But when we're selling a product such as beer in a tasting room, there's an experience that's going on while those people are experiencing your product. And I don't think that will ever change. And in, in the world that we're, we're kind of going towards with AI and the, the amount of technology that's involved, I think it will be desired far, far more than it is now from any consumer of any product or service. That That's interesting, which makes me think of, if I look at real estate as an industry and I look at beer as an industry, those are both like they fall into the category of overcrowded, highly competitive markets. Uh, I'd love to hear, and I'm sure our listeners and viewers would love to hear your insights, personal insights on, well, how do you compete and stand out in overcrowded, over competitive markets? Yeah. Uh, we don't pay too much attention to our competitors and that might be a, uh, a poor answer, Gare, but we do what we think is right and um, what we think our consumers want. And we pay a lot more attention to our consumers than we do our competitors. Um, in both cases, the beer world and the real estate world, I'm a consumer of our product. And before I got into those businesses, I was a consumer. Uh, as a brokerage model, my consumers are our realtors. I am a realtor. I was a realtor. I I know what the day to day looks like for a realtor. I know where the pinch points are. I know I know where life sucks as a realtor and what you want uh, to be better. So we talk to our realtors a lot because they're our, our consumers. Um, and then in the, on the beer side, it was the same thing. Before we got into the beer world, we were craft beer tourists, and we loved experiencing uh, different um, establishments in different geographies. And we learned from those experiences. And and to this day, like. Uh, the craft beer world, Gare, there's there's a lot of turnover and there's about to be a lot more turnover of the small craft breweries that are, they're wonderful people. They were good beer people, but it's a hard business to make money in and until you get to a certain scale. Um, we pay, we don't pay much attention to them. We just, we put our heads down. We do what we think is right for our consumers and we try to deliver them incredible experiences. You know, um, they say there's no better teacher than failure. What's something you actually failed at? And what did you learn? Yeah. Oh, I fail all the time. It's, it's, uh, 
I couldn't get my three-year-old dressed this morning. I don't know if that's a failure big enough to talk about on a, a podcast as prestigious as this one. Um, yeah, you know, and I think this ties it. Uh, the, the question that you hear a lot on podcasts is if you could change something or if you could go back. And what, and uh, the, the thing I always think about when that question comes up is, and you hear it quite often when people say, I wouldn't change anything. The failures are the best. They're, at the time, it sucks, absolutely sucks, and be miserable about it for 24 hours and then figure out why it's why it happened and how you can improve upon it. Um, the one that really sticks with me that I, I uh, this is going to sound kind of funny, but I made a $3 million mistake. Uh, we bought a building, there was a significant renovation that needed to be involved in it. And this is 100% on me and my fault. And uh, we picked the wrong general contractor. I wasn't paying enough attention. It was a time in the market where I was just too busy. And um, it was a $3 million mistake making that decision to use that contractor. Um, I learned a tremendous amount about permitting and structural engineering and uh, dealing with trades and architects and engineers that I would have not had any clue about if I picked the right people. Um, now I'm, I want to say I'm an expert in all that process and I could be a general contractor after that because it stretched out for three years and it was $3 million. Um, but again, that, I learned a tremendous amount and that $3 million was the most expensive mistake and probably the best one I have made. Is that a $3 million tuition? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I would have, I, again, going through that process, I, I yeah. probably would have rather paid a uh, hundred grand to go to university, but uh, yeah, you could you could have gone to Harvard and Stanford and maybe <laughs> Oxford and Cambridge on yeah. on that, but maybe not have learned as much. No, 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 and you know what, Gary? Uh, business lessons for sure. Um, it also taught me a lot about managing stress and bringing stress home. And uh, it was I, I I I'm a pretty disciplined person, but uh, it was it was easy to come home pissed off after a day of fighting with contractors or uh, writing a check that I didn't want to write. Um, and that was actually one of the things that came out of it was that three 30 gym time that I have every day. That's my buffer between anything that goes on in the day. That's bad to now at the time I didn't have children, but now coming home to the kids is if I have anything lingering or any, anything clouding my brain from being a good dad, when I get home, it's dealt with from three 30 to four 30. And that's, yeah, you're incredibly structured and disciplined and very intentional, but also intentional about your involvement with Tech Canada. I know Julia yeah. Olton, who's one of the top Tech Canada chairs in the country, is your chair. Take us inside for people listening and wondering. It's 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 a very closed group uh, because all kinds of things happen in there where. Uh, you're like each other's board of directors, um, but can you speak a little bit to that, you know, without betraying confidences, of course, because yeah. confidentiality is at a premium, but a little bit about some of the emotions and vulnerabilities that are experienced inside those types of groups. Yeah, um, and maybe a quick story on how I got involved with tech would help with this is uh, Ryan Walter, who has, has spoken to many tech groups, played in the NHL and won the Stanley Cup. Uh, is a, a friend of mine. And uh, I was talking to him one day and I, I, I said, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of that it's lonely. It's lonely being a leader sometimes conversation. And I sometimes have people I can bounce stuff off of, but a lot of my, my, uh, my day-to-day -day people that I see aren't, don't have the same problems as I do. And I don't have the same problems as they do. Um, so he introduced me to Julia and tech. And uh, that was, I think I've been a member of tech almost a year now. Um, it's exactly what I needed. Um, so walking into that room, number one, our group was incredibly welcoming. Um, it's It's been really beneficial for me to hear other people's problems and other people's challenges. Um, it, it's somewhat uh, what well, you learn from their problems and you're unlikely to make, or you're less likely to make those mistakes that they've made or when the, you have a challenge that has come up already, you have a better toolkit to deal with it. Mm. Um, and the thing that somewhat surprised me was uh, personal and professional is what comes up in these meetings. So there's questions around uh, kids and raising raising your children and um, uh, marriage conversations and and 
it, it's sort of all encompassing, not just uh, what problem do I have with my CFO or I can't hire somebody. Can somebody help me do that? There's all those things, but it, it's more holistic than um, what I had uh, initially thought it would be. It, it becomes intensely personal. And you just reminded me of uh, a great friend of mine and you know him from chapter two of, 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 the book, uh, Big Little Legends, uh, is Jim Gilbert. Jim was a founding member of his Tech Canada group uh, back in Fredericton, New Brunswick with Mike Mallory. And one of the things Jim related to me was that you look around just the members, just look at the members and think of their daily rate of, of yeah, yeah. And, and how much you benefit just from the other members. I, I, I'd love you to expand on that in terms of the learning that takes place just from around the table. Yeah, that's a that's a good way to uh, sort of compartmentalize that. It is so our group are uh, it's a CEO group, and they're all leaders of very successful companies, and some of them incredibly large. Uh, it would be incredibly difficult to knock on someone's door and ask in our room for their time. Um, I couldn't afford to pay most of the people in that room for any uh, significant amount of uh, time advice. Um, and also the the varying uh, industries and and thought processes that the different characters of people that are in there and all quadrants of the the profiles the personality profiles so you'll get varying answers you throw a question on the table of what color is the sky today and you'll get seven or eight uh questions back and good feedback and um varying perspectives and there could be a few right answers in in those um, I've, I've had a, 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 a tremendous amount of great advice out of that group um, and a lot of um, thought provoking questions. So you've been in the tech rooms many, many times, Gary. And um, one of the processes that I love is when you put a challenge on the table, no one answers it right away. They ask you questions back, which uh, in my experience of putting a challenge on the table, I thought I had a problem and here's my problem. And then I get asked 10 questions and my problem's actually over here and I have to solve this, not this, um, which is incredibly valuable. It really speaks to um, another thing that will never change for the next thousand years. Um, from a leadership perspective, you can't read the label when you're stuck inside the bottle. And so mm -hmm. what I hear it, with your peer advisory group, uh, with fellow CEOs, uh, those dynamics create a situation where you're not stuck inside the real estate world, the beer world. You see it thanks to your, your colleagues from a, from multiple perspectives. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. The, is, is there any way, so that leads to, is there any, like now let's talk about what is the value of, of clear perspective? How, how how much of a premium do you put on that? Yeah, it's, I, it's funny. I joke with Julia. I won't give you the specific example, but uh, it was, I want to say two two months ago, we had a significant hire. Um, and I had a, a, what I thought, again, this was the, I thought my question was here. So I asked that question over here uh, with my challenge. And then the group answered it way over here and gave me some advice on how to do the hire. And, and uh, uh, it saved me a hundred grand like in annual salary, um, right up front. So I, I joked with Julia that I guess I have to be a member of tech for a lot of years here to, to pay back that value. That that's, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah. let's, uh, let's, uh, because yeah, perspective, that's what I keep hearing in, in my experiences with groups like tech Canada is you, you, you need to be able to see it from well outside and from high above to, to make those, uh, mission critical decisions. I think that's what they call them now. Uh, but let's go a little more up close and personal. Uh, Jamie Schrader. You could have a one-on-one -on -one dinner date with anyone dead or alive. Who would you dine with? So Gary, I cheated. We, we asked uh, your wonderful staff, uh, your tech podcast staff, if there was any questions that I needed a heads up on because I like to be prepared. And they mm -hmm. said there was none, but I listened to two of your podcasts this morning and I, I got ahead of this. So, uh, uh, and you mentioned Winston Churchill earlier, the Winston Churchill would be the one, uh, just his decision-making processes and ability to handle stress. 
and his love of of alcohol while he was doing it all i'd be he'd be a, a heck of a party date it that's a that's a match made in heaven jamie and winston <laughs> smoking cigars tipping back a few tumblers of sherry or port or whatever the drink uh, may be um okay so let's do it this way Let's do the thing that's never happened before on the leadership standard. This, as you know, the day we're doing this as it's being live streamed is the anniversary of the Calgary Flames 1989 Stanley Cup win. <laughs> so if there's one pet peeve I have is when, when the subject of sports comes up, the people who shamelessly flaunt their team allegiances. Um, yeah. So, you know, we know that Lanny McDonald uh, scored the goal that gave uh, Calgary the victory at the <laughs> Montreal Forum over Ryan Walter and the Habs at that time. Uh, what yeah. are your I, I, iconic sports memories that you cherish the most? Yeah, uh, I, I'm a big Canucks fan. So through that 2012 run, I, I was at a lot of those games. Um, I was there the night they lost and there was the Vancouver riots and ended up in a lockdown in a McDonald's while everyone was getting tear gassed outside. That was quite memorable. Um, one of them was, uh, I'm a big Chelsea fan, uh, European soccer, so English soccer. And uh, I was actually at a hockey tournament in Kelowna um, with one of my, or a lot of my good buddies. And one of my other good buddies is a really big Chelsea fan too. So we ended up watching the Champions League final in a bar and we missed our hockey game to watch this because it went into extra time and then a shootout and uh, Didier Drogba scored in a shootout to win the Champions League final. And um, needless, and that was a, so European soccer, the games are on at noon for the finals, local time here in BC. So uh, we were at it pretty early and we were going for the rest of the day because we were so excited. That was a fun day. If day-to-day -day life at your company, let's do the real estate uh, organizations that you're involved with. If day-to-day -day life was a movie or TV show, what would it be? Oh, good question. Day-to-day -day life. I can tell you it's nothing like those uh, realtor shows on HGTV that my wife watches. Um, it's very, very different in the real world as most things are when you go from the screen to real life. Um, love and, and, uh, just stage of life with young children and busy business. I don't get to watch much TV, but, um, it is, uh, Yellowstone, which there's a business component. There's a real estate component. And then there's the, the fun side of of uh the cowboy world which i don't get to do that fun cowboy world speaking of yellowstone everyone now is leaning in very carefully to hear your you hear you weigh in what are your best binge watching recommendations yeah so and this this is going to be a funny answer uh we get through I've, I haven't watched start to finish like any of the big ones, like the, the Walking Dead or Breaking Bad, or I think the only one I've gotten through is Yellowstone. And part of the reason for it is, again, stage of life. I rarely get through any binge watching because I'm asleep on the couch at nine o'clock. What books are you reading right now? Uh, I just finished uh, uh, Red Notice by Bill Browder, which is... Um, um about his interaction with uh russian oligarchs and the breakup of the soviet union and when that dissolution happened that was a fascinating book so true stories in it um i've got what do i have teed up i've got one i can't remember the name of it now off the top of my head but it's it's about the new zealand all blacks uh and their restructuring or their 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 shift in culture uh, that was done a few years ago. I'm, I'm blanking on the name of it right now, but I'm really looking forward to that one because it touches on culture and sport. I, I know there are times when you're in your car and you've got, you know, the playlist cranked up to Keith Urban and or Notorious B.I.G. <laughs> but when you turn the music down, what do you think about the most when you're alone in your car? That's a good question. Uh, what do I think about the most when I'm in my car? I, I think a, I, time management is a big one for me. So I'm usually thinking about how to either uh, create, usually how to create space. So 
how can I shift something so that I can do something else? Or, um, and again, the stage of life, uh, I think a lot about the girls and what they're up to. And, uh, uh, I, yeah, the, the creating space, a lot of it has to do with them now that how can I move something so I can go do an extra hour with, with one of my daughters at whatever that is crawling around on the floor or playing in the backyard. What you're doing on so many levels as an entrepreneur and as a business leader and as a dad would make any parent proud. Uh, tell us a little bit about your parents, Wade and Shannon. Yeah, uh, they're great parents. They're very patient parents. Uh, I've got a couple brothers. Um, we we're all idiots. Um, the, uh, my dad was, my dad actually worked with Julia uh, at IBM when Julia was uh, starting out. Um, so he, he was a sort of middle manager uh, with IBM, worked there from 19 years old to, I think he retired at 60 or 60. I think 60. Um, my mom was a uh, secretary in uh, my elementary school for a few years, which wasn't very fun. Um, the threat of calling your parents was uh, very common. And uh, I got that just by with my teachers walking down the hallway. Um, yeah, they're great parents. They're uh, very modest means. We were very middle class growing up. Uh, we've got a pretty tight knit uh, immediate family and then a pretty tight knit sort of secondary family with, with all my cousins. As we, uh, this has been fun. You and I uh, could literally talk about business and life uh, for hours on end, Jamie, and and never run out of material. But as we wrap up uh, this segment, I, I want you to focus on um, and, and inspired a little bit by your tech group with Julia. If you think of business leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, people listening right now. Less about the answers. What is the number one question that leaders need to be asking of themselves right now? Uh, and th this is a time-tested one, and I I, I want to say it was it 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 falls back on Ford and their model originally with the what business are we in, um, and understanding what that business is, and and that could be. Um, the Ford example is what what business are we in? It's the people moving business. You have to move people from point A to point B and um, understanding that before you answer any strategic questions or any significant st strategic questions with any of the businesses that you're in. Yeah, that's a great one. Kodak thought they were in the film business when they were really in the making memory business. Blockbuster yeah. thought they were in the in the uh, video rental business before realizing as Netflix pointed out, they're really in the home entertainment business. Jamie, like I said, we could go on and on. This is the part where, how do people connect with you online? Uh, they can, I know go to craft beer anytime they're in Langley and you'll definitely yeah. have a beverage with them. Cause I, <laughs> yeah. I can vouch for that. Uh, yeah. But, but tell yeah. us uh, uh, all, the, all the connection points and put in a plug for your hockey team too. Sure. No, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm a little elusive on social media and uh, I know you don't want to hear that because, and I should have answered that last question with uh, something that if my, my friend Gare Maxwell told me I need to be in the media business, which uh, we've had a lot of conversations ar around internally and in, in how we can structure that. Um, not in my nature to be on TikTok videos, but uh, I think the the organizations have to have a personality and they have to have um, a feel for that as well. Uh, so the, to answer your question on social media, I'm pretty elusive there. Uh, I'm always happy to answer any, any questions by phone or by email, if there are any, or, um, and like you say, if anyone's ever out this way, I'm, I'm a very reachable guy. And, uh, yeah. And one more, uh, Jamie, that hockey team, yeah. tell us what's yeah. on the horizon. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's, a, it's actually, uh, probably, um, one of the most exciting times in junior hockey uh the junior a league in bc left hockey canada a few weeks ago which is going to turn the uh our model upside down in a good way we voted in favor of it as did the other eight or 17 teams in our league um so that league is uh college tracking so our league puts kids into the ncaa a lot of division one full ride ncaa scholarships um 30 percent of the ncaa in division one is from our league 30% of the N the NHL is from the NCAA. So we've got some really, really talented hockey players. Um, the hockey is thrilling. It's exciting. And uh, what myself and my business partner there 
are are the most excited about is bringing people together to to watch uh, really intelligent, really talented hockey players. And uh, again, the experience side of things, uh, both him and I have a background in, in hospitality and um, making a very memorable experience for uh, the fans that are going to come to these hockey games is, is what we're really excited about. Jamie, thanks again uh, for stopping by and doing this. Uh, much appreciated. Yeah, I really appreciate the invite, Gary. It's, it's always fun talking to you. Thanks again. Jamie Schrader joining us from Langley, British Columbia. And if you want to know more about Tech Canada and its world-class leadership programs, check out the website www.tech-canada.com. What was it that Jamie spoke of that made you stop and think? My biggest takeaway was the $3 million tuition uh, to learn all kinds of things that Jamie never would have learned at Harvard, Stanford, Oxford, Cambridge, and a few other universities. But what was yours? Because we're always interested to hear and we greatly appreciate your feedback. Our direct email is podcast at tech, T-E-C dash Canada. Dot com. And of course, if you enjoyed the leadership standard in this conversation with Jamie Schrader, feel free, share it with others in your online social networks. Yes, do it. Like, subscribe, share that we might inspire someone else to grab hold of the clutch and go full throttle in this new frontier. So on behalf of everyone, Lucy making her first appearance behind the scenes, Stephen Christofferson, Alexander, Executive producer, Mark Johnson, Catronel, uh, this is Gary Maxwell. Thanks again for being part of it here at the Leadership Standard. <laughs>